I come in the studio, I lay out my materials and I just go to work and to see what, <laughs> what happens. It's Whether so it's great. collage or, or, <laughs> or, or, or canvas. Yeah. Art making doesn't have to look any particular way. Anything goes. What we make and how we make it is really of no importance, except, of course, to the artist. There can be so much pressure to figure it all out. So it makes sense most want to create, you know, some degree of certainty in this nebulous art making thing. I gave up figuring out my art quite a few years ago and just finally accepted that maybe everything's just going to work out if I just kept making my art and paid attention. So today, I no longer plan what I'm doing in the studio. Instead, show up and let myself be surprised. Recently, I came across some really great paintings. I just love them. I felt this artist's art process was similar to mine, so I became curious. I could tell there wasn't a lot of pre-planning going on in his work. The result was too fresh, too daring. So I tracked the artist down. His name is Josh Goldberg. He is a poet, artist, and teacher. To listen to how he describes his approach and creative philosophy was mesmerizing. I had to re-listen to this conversation a couple times so I could just take all these notes. It was that good. Join me now as Josh and I are meeting for the first time. You're going to love this. Welcome to Art to Light, a podcast for the creatively curious. My name is Nicholas Wilton, and each week I'll help you rediscover not just the art of your life, but the art in your life. Join me as we explore that perfect blue at twilight, the wild frontiers of art making, and the extraordinary joy of finding your way as you go. Josh, listen, thanks so much for joining me today, this afternoon. First off, I'm not even sure, where are we talking to you from? Where are you located? Okay, I am in Tucson, Arizona. Ah, okay. Okay, great. Where we're expecting the monsoons. Ah, really? Yeah. So listen, I just, to be honest, I just stumbled across your work and I... I loved it. And sure enough, when I read what you wrote about it, I loved that. And I just, I just went on that. And that's why I reached out. And I've since then, I've been diving into more of what you do. Um, So I'm just super excited. I love the fact that, you know, you, you're very process oriented. I mean, that's one of the things that, you know, is always interested me. And so, um, yeah, so just welcome. I'm I'm excited to dive into this. Thank you. Take us back a little bit before we dive into the work you're making now and and everything. Tell us just a little bit of your background. Well, uh, let's see. I was uh, born and raised in Philadelphia, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. From the moment uh, I was a child, I seemed to have been called to do art. My mother tells me that uh, wherever she took me as, as an infant, all she had to do was put some crayons in my hand. Yeah. I would sit down on the floor or in a corner and just draw on paper. So that that stayed with me. And, you know, it sounds corny, but I see it really as a calling. To me, it's not a, uh, a vocation. It's really a calling. Yeah. I remember when I went to art school, I went to art center in LA and, and when they gave the big kind of talk to all these kids, you know, all these young people from all over the world who had been brought in and got into the school, he said, you know, you guys were all those weirdos in, in your elementary school. You were the kids who were drawing in the corner. You were the kids and now you're all together. And I, and I I know you were that. (laughs) That's right. I I was a kid where in school where the other kids would come up and say, Hey, can you, can you draw me this? Can you draw me that? And the teachers would say, uh, I need uh, a mural, you know, a paper mural in the classroom of the planets. Can you do that? So I I was the one that, that did it. No, that's so cool. And so you went, did you go to art school and everything? I did go to art school. Um, I actually, I went to a, a textile college at first because my parents didn't want me to go to art school. And so I was in this textile, Philadelphia College of Textiles and Science, and I happened to take an art class. And the art teacher said, you're wasting your time here. You better get yourself an art school. And uh, he helped me, ma- you know, make a portfolio. At that time, you had to prepare a portfolio, which took like six months. And um, I got into art school. I went to Tyler School of Fine Arts, which was part of Temple University. Yeah. 
Okay. And, uh, and, and so that tricky transition of get out of school and then go into a room and try to make something and sell it and all like, how did, how did all that go? I mean, that, that for me was really gnarly. <laughs> well, you know, I, I, I never had a problem with that. Uh, not that, you know, I sold everything, but I always felt that um, if the time was right, it would happen. I would wow. sell if the time was right. I would I would show. And frankly, I just kept making my art. And sure enough, um, somebody saw it and gave me a show and wanted to handle my work. And it just went from there. Wow. So, you know, is your process like you make a body of work and then you have a show and then you make a body? I mean, is that, are you in that group? Yeah. 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 I, I, I have a kind of a, a, an interest. Well, I don't know if it's interesting. It's always interesting to me, but um, I start off by, by doing my paintings, paintings on canvas. So I, I do so many of them that I can almost, I can feel when I'm peaking and then I change over and I do painting on paper. Same thing happens. I do so many, I peak, then I go to drawing. I do so many, I peak on that, then I go to prints and, and so forth. And so I have this sort of cycle that I go through and uh, takes me right back to, you know, point one when I'm, you know, doing paintings again. Wow. So you, you change up, you know, in order to stay fresh and engaged, absolutely. you change the the way you're working or different materials. Yeah, absolutely. I, I For me... That keeps it fresh. Yeah, it really does. That. Yeah, it keeps it fresh. And, you know, one of the things that, I, that I'm very keen about is I don't want to repeat myself. I want every piece that I'm doing to be something different. Now, it may have, you know, my, mm -hmm. my signature marks or whatever you want to call it. But for me, it has to be something different about it so that I don't repeat myself. Yeah. Yeah. And have you, you know, your current work and for those of you guys listening, you know, hop on over to art to life.com and under podcasts, you can see Josh's work. I mean, it's just gorgeous, okay. but the way you're working is you don't have a plan, right? It's very, could you just, have you always been comfortable in, in sort of that unknown, uh, kind of, you know, process? Yeah, what, what, what's interesting is that I'm, un, I'm very comfortable with that in the studio. Outside the studio, no, not so comfortable. You mean in your life, right? That's right. Yeah, yeah, well. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is my chance in the studio, you know, to let things happen, to let it go, mm -hmm. to, be, to be free and uncontrolling in a sense. Yeah. But, uh, but in life, it's a, it's a little different. It's it's so funny because I was much more controlling when I was younger and I would sort of plan things and, you know, try to repeat myself and, you right. know, all the tedious ways we try to preserve our self-confidence or something, you know, to get these results, to keep certainty. But I'm telling you, I could not, I don't even have a friggin' idea. I don't even think about it anymore. I just go to the studio and I just right. start. Yeah. So that's what you're involved in. That's exactly what I do. I have, the only thing I know that I, that I want to do when I get in the studio, if I want to work on a canvas or a paper, if I want to draw and so forth. But once I get in there, I just lay out the materials and without a thought in mind, I just start working. And then I work off of what I, you know, what I put down. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And so do you have a sense of, of where this is all going? I mean, if you, if you fly up to 50,000 feet and you look back a couple of years and you look down now at what you're doing, like, I mean, I get, I, and you wrote some of this and, and this is what I, this is for me, it's the same. And I think that's what attracted to me. Like I totally resonated with what, what you wrote. This idea that, you know, some marks feel bigger and, and sort of more universal and they're tapping Absolutely. into something bigger than ourselves. And yeah, I'm terrible at articulating this and you do it so well. What what do you what is this? No, you're absolutely right. I mean, you hit the nail right on the head. You know, most people talk about art as uh, seeing and feeling, but I have learned just with my own work anyway that art is a way of knowledge. It's a way of knowing. It's a, it's a form of gnosis, right? Mm. And so in a sense, I don't see what I do as being representational, but I see it as being more 
presentational. By that, I mean the work reveals something to me about myself, about the human condition, or about, like you just mentioned, about the universals that are out there. Yeah. So it, I don't want to, you know, sound corny and say, well, you, you know, it's about the totally about psyche or soul or whatever you want to say. But it does speak to me of presence. In yes. fact, I even I even coined a, a word uh, for that. It's kind of a, a strange word. Amago Fani. Oh, wait, what? Could you say that again? Amag, amago Fani. Amago meaning image. Oh. And Fani means appearance. So Amago Fani is the appearance of an image. All right. Mm. So often I talk about an Amago Phonic revelation, how the image reveals itself to me. That's what I'm really interested in. What is this image? Where did it come from? What is this? Revelation. And what I've learned, quite frankly, from that is that the work speaks to me on its own terms. OK, so I don't I don't, for example, look at my work and immediately I start interpreting it. Oh, this is you know, I did this and this means this or. So, right. Right. You know, I let the work in a sense unfold in front of me and it has this sense of presence. In fact, often my students would ask me, well, how do you know when you're you know, finish with the work? How do you know when the work is done and you put down your paints? And for the longest time, I, I sort of skidded the question. I didn't want to talk about that because I thought, well, you know, maybe they wouldn't get it. They have to have more experience first. But how I tell that a work is finished is when I say the work has that sense of presence. Now, what I mean by that is when the work says, okay, I'm done. Here I am. Okay. You don't need to do anything more. The work, I, let's put it this way. I no longer look at the work, but the work is looking at me. Mm-hmm. So that, and, and that's a real felt sense. Yes. And, you know, there's presence that is needed in making the work, right? To just right. really drop into this. But there's a presence that, that this work has, you know, that's, that's, in and of itself, it's like there's a, a, a strength and, you know, th- you stand before it and it's got some gravitas, <laughs> you know, it's right. It's powerful. There's right. a presence in the work, which right. also and, signifies something, you know. Yeah. And that strength or gravitas comes from, I, I feel, comes from when the artist, in a sense, loses his or her ego and is working in a sense from a maybe from a state of, you know, sounds again corny and it's bandied about all, but from a state of emptiness, you know, where it comes out on it on its own. And that's the difference I feel between when I use the word imago or the image, you know, with a capital I or image with a small I, there's a difference. The, The image with a small I is what you see all around you, the commercial image. It's a container for something, but the imago, is the mature image. Ah. It's the root image, the root image. It is the image that you just said, you know, makes you stop and and stand in front of it and you're transfixed. To me, that's the imago. Yes, there's, and it's it's so interesting, Josh, because I try to talk about this very same idea to people. And I, one way I get at it and, and, and I, it's a diagnostic that I use in my own work mm-hmm. to sort of, is this, is this getting close, <laughs> you know, because if it doesn't look like anything and it's just a felt right. sense and right. but there's this sense of wonder. And I, and I think exactly. that's a powerful word. Does this stop you? You know, yeah. does it bring you into presence? Yeah. Does it grab you by the yeah. shoulders and just say, yeah. wait a second, like, I don't know what this is, but I think everything's different now. (laughs) Exactly. No, exactly. In fact, you know, the ancient Greeks had a word for it. It was called thalma. Thalma. And it was that the gaze is so compelling that it changes everything. It can change your life. Yes. Literally, literally, thalma uh, means something like miraculous or, or wonder. And you know that when you see a work, whether it's yours or somebody else's, something immediately grabs you. Yes. So is that like, is it like Thelma with an E or what is the? No, T-H-A-U-M-A. Oh my God, that's amazing. 
Okay. Well, I think uh, this might have been the reason why I, I called you up because I, <laughs> I'm there's there's not so many words in the English language that can can start to get at this. Yeah, that's so fascinating. And so sometimes you arrive at this. I know in the kind of work you're making, and I there's this beautiful combination of absolute recklessness and freedom, right? And and a kind of control, right? And, and, and a sort of guidance that you're involved in. Can you just talk about those two opposites? And um, I'm so excited to hear you say something because I love this <laughs> subject. And I, <laughs> yeah, but no, 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 no. But it, it, it's right. I mean, I'm glad that you that you see that, you know, because I'm very conscious of that. Yeah, I, I want to I want to have the opposites, because in a sense, the opposites, you know, positive, negative, you know, up, down, whatever, you know, however you, you know, frame it uh, is very important because I feel it creates a, a life to the work, because if it's, all, for example, if it's all spontaneous, it can fall apart. If yes. it's all too rigidly controlled, there's no life to it. So you have to have that balance. And. I always find words or ideas from other cultures that sort of reinforce that for me. For example, in, in exactly what you're talking about, there's something called the coincidence of opposites, which was a, a thought in medieval terms. OK, coincidentia positorum. That's the Latin word. All right. A coincidence of opposites, And it means just that if you put down. A, you have to put down B. If you put down light, you put down dark. Now, in medieval theology, they talked about it in terms of, you know, in terms of God and heaven and the divine. But, you know, you can take that and you can apply it, I mean, to your own work. Is there this coincidence of opposites? Is this a balancing act, okay, that creates the life, creates the tension of the work? Okay? Yes. And people, I really think people feel that. Oh, absolutely. You don't know this, but this is sort of the cornerstone of, of what I teach, this idea of differences and combining things. And, exactly. You know, I mean, the way your work, you know, what, what I love about your work and work that is not, you know, figurative or objective, subjective, okay. is that when I look at your work, I think feel the state you were in when you made it. I, I get a sense of the, right. you know, it's like, it's a river that's flowing kind of out of control, but you're controlling the banks of it in a way, you know? Right. And it does translate. I mean, it's almost more subjective than, you know, a picture of a barn, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, it really lands. It's amazing that we can, that the paint can communicate the, right. This internal state, you know, it's just sort of blows my mind. You know, yeah, the paint, the painting has its own visual recital, so to speak. Ah, I love that. Uh, and so, you know, it's, for example, I look at it in this way. I'm working. I don't know where I'm going with it. I don't know what kind of image is going to pop up. But when it does, all of a sudden, it's as if the image raises its head from the back room of the heart and is there is showing itself to me. And all I have to do is in a sense, go with it. See, either <laughs> leave it alone or, you know, make it clearer or whatever. But basically it's there. Something arises that I had no idea that would actually happen. And so it's, you know, in a way it's very magical. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Magical, mysterious. And that's why I often feel like somehow it's larger than myself when I get in the studio. It's an activity much, much larger. Yes. And it, it's this idea that we just have to create the, you know, I mean, in a way, that's what the art practice is. You set this time aside, right. you stop doing your to-do list and things come out finally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and, and basically, you know, people often ask me, you know, well, well, you know, where did you go to school and, you know, who do you like and blah, blah, blah and all this. And I, you know, I go, never mind that. I say, I'm in the tradition of the cave painters. Yeah. Well, yeah. You, that's how far back we go. Yeah. OK. You know, painting on walls, you know, spitting the paint out, you know, <laughs> from your mouth and yes. you know, doing things. 
that has a magical quality to it. Yeah, absolutely. And like what it, what it feels like to do that. I mean, you know, it sounds like, you know, you're very articulate about this whole affair and, and I presume you teach. I do teach. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, I teach. Yeah. And, and I've looked, you know, it's something that interests me. And, you know, I wonder, for example, I'll do a, a work and I'll look at it and go, well, who did that? Yeah. You know, you know where did that come from? Yes, yes. You know, and so it's to me, it's, you know, whether, you, like I said before, whether you say it comes from the soul, the psyche, you know, is it, you know, a kind of Jungian act of imagination or a Zen emptiness, what, what, how, you can call it anything you want. But it's just some mysterious process that I think that, well, you know, I'm sure musicians can say the same thing and writers and so forth. I'm curious if you agree, but when we let go of control, I mean, I've had it when, I mean, just in my life, I'll have, you know, the train wreck of a day, you know, where, you know, the tire gets flat and then you're late to pick up your daughter and then this and this, and you just keep thinking this cannot get worse and you're yeah. struggling. And then at some point you just, I just can't, you just kind of give up and, you know, break down. Yeah. And but then you just sort of like sit down and then you notice this amazing bird that comes down, you know, what right. it's like all of a sudden you need spaciousness. You need to, yeah. to relinquish a kind of grasping, then sort of the magic can happen. And, and yeah. I don't, I think art making is just, it's just an opportunity for that to occur. But I think this can occur, you know, when in a writer or for anybody doing yeah. anything. Yeah. Or an athlete. Uh, yeah. Yes. Anything. Yeah. I, I mean, really, when you look at it, that's the gift that is given to us. Yes. I mean, it really is a gift of, of what we're here to do is we're to, to listen to this and, and right. see what we can make. Right. Right. It does seem to come out of a, of an effort or a, a desire to make more, make something, create something, push something, you know, it's, right. it's proactive. Yeah. That catalyzes this, this yeah. interesting process of, of yeah. becoming or. Yeah. 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 And, and, you know, and you have to be open to it. How do you help those kind of behind you to be comfortable in this unknown territory when in all of life, you know, we're, we're, we're taught to, you know, keep coloring within the lines. What do you say? How do you, do you think this is something that you can learn or is it something that, you know, it's part of your Enneagram? Yeah, uh, both. I think it's, you know, for some, it's part of their nature. It's who they are. Uh, for others, I think that they have it. I, let's say, put it this way. I think everyone has that within them. But I think some people know how to tap into it. Mm -hmm. uh, others can be taught. It's the same thing with, with you know, the, the arts that itself. You know, I mean, I do think for me, it was a calling. For somebody else, it could be a learned process. Yeah. Right? Now, the difference is how much time maybe a person who's learning it would want to devote to it, how much sacrifice or suffering the person that has it as a calling, they don't even think about that. They just have to do it. Yes. There's levels and degrees mm -hmm. of activity there. Yeah. And the, and the seduction is different and, exactly. you, you know, it can come later. It can come earlier. It can yeah. be broken in half in a life. That, that's right. That's right. Do you feel as I do that this, this possibility is, is really in everybody, this creativity, this uh, ability to, to make something. I do. I do. You know, if you watch children, children have that innate possibility. They have that innate creativity. Yeah. What happens is you mentioned this before they're start, they're taught. Oh yeah. You know, you went outside the lines. You know, it's beaten into them that, no, that's wrong. You, you, yeah. you know, you can't do that. Right. Yeah. I remember my, my granddaughter was working on a poster and after she, she did it, she showed me and it was not symmetrical. You know, she didn't have what she wanted exactly in the center. And I said, wow. I said, you know, if you put it in the center, look how boring it would be, you know. Mm -hmm. And she took it to class and the teacher gave her a lesser grade for it. Oh. And I went in to see the teacher. No way to go. Yeah. And I, I said, how can you say that? I, and I 
explain to her, you know, yeah. if you if she put that image exactly in the center, it would have been dull. The message of the work would have been curtailed. I said, however, now I said, you know, it's interesting. People look at it. And finally, she she said, well, you know, I guess you're right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that's, that's what I mean. You know, that kind yeah. of institutional yes. way of seeing things. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, yes. And, and, you know, the very fact that she put it in a place that she felt was right. Exactly. That's the reason it's good is because that's it right. feels like her. That's <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You deal with that all the time. Yeah, yeah. And so I'm curious, you know, you, you, you're in the studio. I know, tell us a little bit about the materials um, and, and the sizes that you work. I guess you, the paintings are large. I generally work on three sizes for my canvases. And I like the square more, more than uh, the rectangular. So four by four, five by five, six by six. Mm -hmm. Seven by seven, you know. Why is that? Because I'm the same way. And I, and I don't people know. ask me that all the time. I, I just, I just like not having the proportional issue be part of my work, right? Like one side's longer, like why? Yeah, right. Maybe, maybe that's it, you know, but there's something almost perfect about it, you know, mm -hmm. about a square. And I, and I really like it. You know, we could say, well, you know, it's the four corners of the world and all that. Kind of. yeah, that right, has nothing right. to do with it. No, yeah, but no. I just like the shape of it. Yeah, I really do. Yeah. And when I work on something that's rectangular, like, for example, my paper, usually paper I have is, you know, it's rectangular. It's satisfying, but not as satisfying as this would be uh, in a square format. So I like that. So I work on the canvases and then I like to work on paper. And as I mentioned, I like to change up. So if I'm painting, you know, I'll you know, canvas, I'll move to painting on paper, I'll draw, I'll make print, I'll do mono prints. I like to do that. Uh, I like collage. I like that fun with collage. And in my collage work, well, actually, in all the things I do, I do the same as I do in my paintings. I have no idea what I'm doing. I come in the studio, I lay out my materials, and I just <laughs> go to work and to see what, what happens. It's so Whether it's great. collage or, 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 or canvas. Yeah. You know, it's like in any other profession, you know, you, you might get, you might not get arrested, but you just need to be <laughs> escorted out of the building immediately. You know, if you're working for Schwab and you're like, look, could I come in? I <laughs> yeah. really don't know what I'm doing, you know, and, <laughs> yeah. um, but it, but in this case, it's, it's That's just, right. I mean, we all want to be you. I mean, this is a huge <laughs> accomplishment. It's taken your lifetime to get to this place of unknowing. I mean, it's just That's so right. cool. That's right. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it's great. So you get going and I'm just curious where you get stuck, right? Like where, where do you get stuck or yeah. So you just don't, you're not getting stuck because it's just an opportunity to like cruise somewhere else. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. Exactly. I don't get stuck. I don't um, get frustrated. I mean, when I was younger, I did. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. you know, I, I and, and I tell my students this, you know, you know, why are you why are you agonizing, you know, over your work? <laughs> I said, you can always rework it. You know, I yeah. said, that's the beauty right. of what we're doing. We can rework it. Yeah. If you don't like it, then you rework it. Right. That's all there is to it. So how can how can it fail? You know, I tell yeah. them, don't believe in success or failure when, when in terms of process. It doesn't work out that way. You know, those are just empty words. Right. Just get involved in the process. Look at the process. And that process is, I feel, a universal process. That's the process of the universe. It really is. That's ah. how things work. It's the same process as the seasons, the same process as aging, evolution, all that. Okay, We just don't recognize that. Well, yeah. I mean, I, th I think this idea, you know, finding your way as you go, this is really my interest in life. And I, I think it's like not really knowing where you're going and things kind of work out in a really interesting way. Yeah. That's kind of like a pretty cool way to make art. And it turns out it's a pretty damn interesting way to live. So aging, that's interesting. So aging is the same thing. I mean, because we're just kind of making mistakes and corrections until we die or what? <laughs> that's what, right. 
Yeah, yeah. we're reworking ourselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then we turn to stardust and then an, another right. baby's born and, and, yeah. and there's a whole and look, like. Yeah. And you can, you know, I mean, you can, you can get depressed if you, if you're, if you're negative about it, but I, I look at it in this way, you know, it's like, there's two abysses. Okay. There's the abyss of the well, and then there's the abyss of the stars. Mm. Which one would you rather mm. be looking towards? Mm -hmm. right? And so, you know, in that sense, uh, you're given a choice, you know. I know you've written Psalms and I mean, you know, you've got some, some books and your faith right. is a big part of this, right? I mean, could you yeah. talk about that a little bit? Just, well, I mean, in fact, in fact, we are talking about it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 I, yeah I don't, I don't see any separation yeah, I between get that, that and, and my work. I don't see any separation between my writing and my work, my studio work. And so, yeah, I, 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 I like to write, I like to write poetry. I like to write essays you know the thing that i'm really interested in is well there are a lot of things well one is of course the, the studio but of, outside the studio is how people how we see as a species how we see what is it we're seeing how we view reality and especially especially now when there's so much hatred and so much violence yes how we're uh how can you say it? How we're almost condemned to repeat this over and over and over. And I believe because we don't look deeply into ourselves. Yes, yes. We really don't. And I think if we could, we might be able to get, as a species, maybe get some insight into, you know, what we're doing. Yeah. The, the sense of embodiment, the sense of, you know, I mean, the process of, making work and standing in front of it and yeah. getting a visceral sense in your chest or in your, yeah. you know, of what's happening. I don't think it would be possible to take on the violence or to per perpetrate this violence if people were connected to this to this deeper part of themselves. Right. I mean, you look at, you know, like Putin in the photographs. I mean, it's yeah. it's robotic, it's disconnected, right. it's yeah, it is steely and it is completely disconnected and, and it's terrifying. It's true. No, it's true. It is, it is. One of the things I I used to do, I used to go into the schools, mm -hmm. the elementary, junior high, and high schools, and I used to teach students how to put up a gallery in their school. And so how, how they could be their own curators, their own installers, their own docents. And so th and throughout Tucson, I maybe put in about 12 galleries in different schools and different levels of schools. And you'd be surprised. I mean, this is obvious. You know, students' academic work got better. Discipline was never problem. I, I used to get at-risk students. That's, that's who I wanted. I would say, give me your at-risk students. <laughs> yeah. Let's let, let, let me train them to be these curators and docents and installers. Wow. And it was amazing. It was really, really amazing. The change that would happen. And it sounds like a cliche, but you know, you put a, a paintbrush or a pencil uh, in the hand of a student, it's unlikely that they'll pick up a gun or a knife. Yeah. You know, I teach a lot of these destination workshops and, uh, you know, it's basically we go somewhere kind of cool, you know, Mexico or Morocco or something for a week. And, you know, it's 20, 30 people come and, you know, we're going to, we're making art the whole time pretty much. And, you know, there's three hours in the morning and three hours in the evening. And sometimes I wonder, you know, is this going to like, what, are they going to do this the whole time? You know, but right. what's incredible is that it's never a problem. This is such an engaging activity. And these people are all different levels from all different walks. Of life. Nobody's yeah. ever like, you know what? I just, it, who wants to go to a movie? You know, right, there's right. something about this self-exploration thing. If, if the art is presented in a way that's, you know, that, that can yeah. catalyze it, you know, and be right. safe and all the other things, but right. 
Because at the end of the day, I, th- I think this is why we're here. It's the, it's the big inquiry, you know? Right. And, and right. you know, these kids that aren't fitting in, I mean, they're just bouncing around from externalities and rules and the walls of society, but man, they, there's so much freedom awaiting them and that's what they need. And that's in there. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. It, it, it is life changing. It is. I mean, it was for me as a, as a kid, because I felt isolated. I mean, mm-hmm. my parents did not, did not want me to be an artist. <laughs> really? <laughs> no, really. They did everything to dissuade me. <laughs> and when I went to art school, you know, I'd bring home paintings and drawings of nudes. My family, my uncles would make fun of it. Oh, you know? my God. oh yeah. Oh yeah. And in fact, when I was a, when I was a kid, I begged my father to you know, let me go to art school. Let me take art lessons. And finally, at one time he relented. He says, okay, he says. <laughs> and so he takes me, this is in Philadelphia, right? So he takes me downtown Philadelphia and this second or third, I don't remember, walk up this, this into this little room. And he said, okay, this is, this is your art school. And what it was, it was a school for mechanical drawing. Compasses, protractors, oh rulers. Yeah. Oh and that's God. that's what he thought, you know? Yes. That's the, the, he felt like that was a big give, you know? Yeah. Like, I'm, I'm going <laughs> to let my, you know, he's going to go wild with protractors and compasses. Right. Hold on, right. you know? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> right. Yeah. So I'm curious when you're working uh, on your work, are you working like you're trying to get the most information and the most feedback you can and, and, you know, the opportunities to see things, do you do things in a series? Do you, what are the ways you work to give yourself the most sort of information or yeah. Guidance maybe. Right. Well, you know, I mean, in terms of guidance, I'm very intuitive. So I let intuition be my guidance in in that sense. Okay. Uh, I, I don't do a lot of work in a series because I feel that I can be repeating myself, as I said before. So I, I'm cautious about that. But if I do a series, for example, like of monoprints, mm-hmm. I'll do a series of maybe three or four mm-hmm. the most. I won't do too many. Okay. Mm-hmm. Part of that is maybe I get bored by the third or fourth one. And so uh, I want something to really spark my interest. I want to, you know, I always, I always, I want to see the magic. I want to see the magic happen. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) And so, so I, I tend not to, you know, do a number of things in a, in a series. And and maybe what I meant more was like, do you have your three things going that you kind of look at behind, you know, out of the corner of your eye while you're working on the fifth one? I mean, are you getting information? Absolutely not. Really? No. And in fact, I tell my students, if you're going to do that, you know, turn the painting around. So you don't see it. Oh, my God. Because, this, like, for I, example, I, I, you know, if they're doing a diptych or triptych, the first thing they want to do is they want to reference, the, say, the first panel or the second yes, panel. Yes. And I say, no, 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 no. That's too easy. You know, you're going to you're going to do something that's going to not have that spontaneity. That's not going to have it's not mm-hmm. going to come from that mysterious area, area in you mm-hmm. area. And so you need to turn that around. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. I do work with looking at a lot of things. I like having, uh, it's not that I'm copying them, but it's yeah, sometimes I, I can feel my energy waning and then I can look over and see where I really cut loose. And I can say to myself, well, come on, you know, like you look at, you showed up over there. Look at how <laughs> pathetic this is. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. I know what you mean. I, I know exactly what you mean. Yeah. So what's so terrifying about doing the same thing or not terrifying, but you, you know, you've mentioned it a couple of times. Like I do not want to like, yeah. is this the sort of slow death that we're all, t- is this mortality <laughs> no, not, we're talking about? No, no <laughs> not, not quite. No. Okay. But I just feel that um, so, something special happens in each, in each piece. Mm. Okay? Something very special. It may come from a you know, different place in me. I, I mean, I, I don't know. But something does happen very special. And each work I view is very special. And as I said, I feel that each work has its own uh, recital, you know, has its own way of saying something uh, to me. Maybe to Mm -hmm. somebody else, that'd be great. But certainly uh, 
to me. And so I want each piece to have its own presence. Just like I have my presence, you know, you have your presence, you know, we all have, have that. And so I feel that if each work can have that, then it's very special unto itself. For me, I'm not saying for anybody else, but for me, when I do more than one or two, it becomes a habit almost. Okay. I start to look at and think or remember, ah, what was successful that I did yes. before and then try to repeat that. But if I know that each piece stands alone and I have to work it and rework it until it shows its face to me, say, until I can feel the pulse of the work, mm -hmm. then I stay with that work. Yeah. Yeah, it's like you're you're raising an individual here, not you know trying to force a kid into being like his brother. You know, right? You're right. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah, good way to put it. I'm just curious. This thing of commissions that you know I get asked to do them all the time. Do you take this on, or or you just? I mean, how do you maintain absolute freedom if someone's saying I like blue? I mean, it, that doesn't happen. Yeah, well, you, yeah, I, I, I <laughs> in the past I've had that problem where just what you said, you know, somebody would come to me and say, you know, oh, I really would love you to do a, a painting, you know, but I want it in blue, you right. know. And <laughs> um, when I was younger, you know, I needed the money, I I would do it. But um, I don't do that. Anymore. I don't because <laughs> I don't want to be beholden to them because they could say, well, you know, I want this, this and that. And, and if I might say, well, sure, I, I can do that. And then in the process, it's something completely different and it's not fair to them. You know, yeah. so I don't, don't want to, you know, have that situation. No, and no, absolutely. You don't want to. Yeah. Yeah. That's it, good, you know, because it's a quandary for so many people, you know, yeah. it's just, it's a problem. You know, I, I had, I had uh, uh, some years ago, a large painting that was uh, sold uh, to this, to this couple and they really liked the painting, really, really liked it. And they had it, the, the wall, the gallery, put it up there. And maybe a couple of weeks later, three, four weeks later, I get a call from the gallery and, gallery owner says josh can you uh, now he said he says don't take it the wrong way he says but can you go over to so-and-so's house you know the very top of the painting there's a let's say there was a dot you know uh -huh. could you paint that out that's bothering the woman of the house <laughs> yeah. and i said uh mike well, i'll tell you what <laughs> this is the color i use to go over it and Paint it out yourself. Yeah. And which he did. <laughs> no kidding. Wow. Yeah. yeah, right. You know, but what can you do? Right. Yeah, exactly. Um, well, listen, you know, we're kind of run, running out of time here, but I just, I'm wondering if I get a lot of questions around, you know, a lot of artists that are kind of just coming into this world and oh. trying to navigate this and get comfortable with it. And, and I'm wondering if you have sort of some, you know, I don't know, your sort of nugget of advice for people that are trying to discover their direction and where they're going. And I mean, style is sort of the dumb word for it. Yeah, but, you know, right. just how to get comfortable in this the terrain of the unknown. Like, what what do you say to to someone who's trying to either be, get into this deeper or let go of work that's more just sort of literal that no longer holds yeah. their interest? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I tell them you have to be real. First of all, they have to be realistic about it. You know, you're, you know, it's unlikely that they're going to be a millionaire by doing what they're doing. Unlikely. All right. They should work. That's the main thing. Do the work. Do the hard work. Mm. You know, don't worry about. I, I hear so many people say at a base level, you know, at a beginning level. Oh, how do I get in a gallery? You know, I go. Why are you thinking about that now? You know, you don't even know how to stretch a painting. You know, you don't even know how to, you're talking about galleries, you know? So you yeah. have to tell them in a realistic way that it's, it's a process and it's an evolution. And if it means something to them, stick with it. And don't let anyone, and I mean anyone, dissuade them. And don't let anyone talk to them about success or failure. Yeah. That's another thing. You know, just do the work because the work that may not look so hot today, tomorrow, all of a sudden may be fantastic. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. You don't know. 
So they have to just keep on working. That's the main thing. Working yeah. and not and not to be afraid of reworking. Yeah. 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 The, the necessity of course correction, it brings a, a depth to the work. It's not yeah. only kind of okay, it's it's really required. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Josh, listen, thank you so much. Um, sure. I knew this was going to be good. Uh, and I just oh, really, uh, I yeah. could talk forever yeah. about yeah. this stuff. Yeah. And can I put in a plug? Please. Yes, yes. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm uh, teaching online on Zoom. Okay. I'm doing a, a, a four talks called Abstract Painting at the Edge of the World. Oh, I love it's, that. It's basically about the what I call the painter's path. And uh, they'll they'll start, I think, July 5th, which is uh, it'll be four consecutive Tuesdays. And if anybody is interested, they could. We, we're going to provide all the show notes, you guys. OK, uh, you know, just go to art to life got dot com and uh, click on uh, podcasts and we'll have that there. All Great. the links, all your website. We're going to have images of your work. So. Now, this is for, for artists, correct? Or is yeah. it for anybody? Yeah, for yeah. painters. Yeah, mainly wow. for painters. But yeah, absolutely. I love the title. So do you have in-person teachings if people want to work with I, you? Directly? I do in Tucson. I do in mm-hmm. Tucson. Uh, oh, fantastic. The, yeah, I do. And um, let me think. This past year, I gave a, a critique class where people would bring in their work and we would, you know, as a group and, and yeah. can tr- critique it. And then uh, an abstract painting class. So, Oh my God, that's yeah. so cool. Yeah. Well, listen, if you um, get out to uh, California direction, Sausalito, you got, we got to have a beer and I'll show you the studio. And Absolutely. And same, you think about yeah. Tucson, you look me up. Yeah. All right. Listen, thank you so much. I know this is going to be really, really cool for so many people. And I just uh, really appreciate you. Thank Uh, you. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Okay, bye-bye. Oh, yeah. One more thing. To find out more about Josh's work, to see examples, and to find links for Josh's courses and teaching, go to arttolife.com and click on podcasts. Hey, thanks for listening to the Art to Life show. If you enjoyed the podcast, please help me get the word out by sharing it with your friends on Instagram at art to life underscore world. The recording of this and all episodes, along with a place to leave comments, see additional photos, and discover a whole new approach to making art, can be found by going to arttolifepodcast.com. And secondly, if you could leave a rating and review in whatever app you're listening on today, I would super, super appreciate it. It makes a big difference. And last but not least, before you go, if you'd like to be on my artist list, every Sunday morning I send out a video blog all about art making. Go to arttolifepodcast.com to sign up. And all these links are in the show notes, of course. Thanks so much for being here, and we'll see you next week. Bye.